and welcome to tonight's AP European History Review. Uh, we are going to be focusing on humanism and the Renaissance especially, and go ahead and ask, you know, let's go ahead and get some uh, discussion going, ask some questions. Okay, LOL, OMG, can you talk about Petrarch? Of course I can talk about Petrarch. All right, so as far as that goes, uh, you know, Petrarch is the father of humanism, okay? So this is basically when the Renaissance got its start. And so if we think about this, what is humanism? Now, what's what's important about this? And let me go ahead and pull up my slides just in case I need them. Uh, you know, I don't want to get too much in a, you know, lecture format to where I'm just like repeating things that I've already said on YouTube and stuff like that. But, uh, you know, as far as that goes, what is the Renaissance, okay? The Renaissance is a rebirth, all right? So the Renaissance Renaissance is a rebirth of classical studies, okay? So as far as that, okay, a teacher, um, very good. All right. Well, thanks. Thanks for uh, thanks for joining us. Now I don't see. Oh, okay. Yeah, I know. Uh, I know you. All right. So yeah, I just had to. It takes a second to read names on here. The names aren't really displayed prominently. Okay. So as far as this goes, remember that Renaissance means rebirth, and you know, so a rebirth of what? Uh, and in this case, a rebirth of the classics. All right. And so essentially, what had happened here? Okay. So even though read the textbook, never read. Okay, so let's go ahead and chat about it then. That it's a rebirth. And what it is, is a rebirth of classicism. Okay, now the thing is, we can talk about classics just in talking to each other. Like I actually started reading uh, Around the World in 80 Days, which is kind of an interesting book. Uh, and really, if you're going to read fiction, think about something for AP Euro. Okay, because when I started reading this, it's talking about like electricity as a new thing. It's talking about how the world is getting smaller. It's like the whole idea of going around the world in 80 days. Now, today you think around around the world in 80 days, what, you know, I could get around the world in like maybe what, two days? Uh, you know, so it wouldn't really take that long to like fly around the world and circumnavigate the world um, in two to three days. I don't know exactly. I'm no scientist. OK, but, uh, you know, at that time, the idea of getting around the world in 80 days on trains and steamships. OK, this was a novel idea in the late 19th century. And so I'm reading a book that's actually kind of augmenting my understanding of late 19th century. European history. Now, the reason I say this is because Around the World in 80 Days is a classic written by Jules Verne. Um, and so we think about like Jules Verne, Charles Dickens, you know, things like that. William Shakespeare as classics. But when we think about classics in the sense of the Renaissance, we're thinking Greek, Roman and biblical literature. Now, a lot of times you'll just see Greek and Roman. I like to put biblical in there because I like to underscore uh, the idea that it's not, you know, that biblical literature is part of this. OK, so when we talk about secularism in the Renaissance, you know, we're not saying that the Renaissance wasn't religious. You know, it's like a lot of the greatest works of art of the Renaissance. When you think about the Last Supper, the Pieta, uh, you know, Michelangelo's David, you know, a lot of these, you know, Michelangelo's Moses, uh, the Sistine Chapel ceiling, uh, that a lot of these works were directly inspired by the, you know, Judeo-Christian tradition and patronized by people who were religious. And so as far as that goes, that although the Renaissance, you see a shift towards secular thinking, okay, that is not exclusively rooted in, you know, the, you know, that the church isn't determining everything. It's still not a world. That, I mean, it's still a world that is very Christian. So secularism, you know, I've seen a distractor on a multiple choice question before where, you know, they're trying to make sure that you understand that secularism isn't anti-religious. Okay. So when we talk about the classics, Greek, Roman, and biblical literature, uh, you know, this uh, basically seeing um, the classical period, okay, which in Western civilization is Greece and Rome. And so seeing the classical period as the epitome of everything, you know, I mean, the high point of human civilization. Now, if we talk to medieval scholars today, I mean, there were actually a lot of uh, inventions in the Middle Ages. You know, in the Middle Ages, they went from two fields crop rotation to three field crop rotation. Now, check this out. When you get to the scientific revolution, four field crop rotation, like, boom, 
mind blown, okay? Um, but the Middle Ages, you know, there are things like they figured out like a new way to collar like a horse for the plow. Uh, you know, so, you know, there are a lot of different inventions, but, you know, so there's some progress, but really as far as Petrarch is concerned, Petrarch and the Renaissance humanist, they look at everything since the fall of Rome, like this thousand year period, this kind of intermediate period between the Renaissance and the fall, you know, the fall of Rome and the Renaissance. And they look at it as the dark ages. OK, so, you know, a lot of times today, even though we know that the Middle Ages uh, you know, that this is a period where there was a great deal of progress, you know, not like the biggest like progress period of uh, the world. But as far as that goes, uh, you know, the Renaissance humanists felt like, no, this was a dark age. OK, this age that was dominated by, you know, Christian thinking and, and not, you know, not that they're attacking Christianity, but just this exclusively Christian thinking uh, that really canceled out the classical tradition. And so what we're seeing here in the Renaissance is really the merging of the Christian and the classical tradition, which had been tried in some ways, like Thomas Aquinas in the Middle Ages um, in his Summa Theologica, uh, you know, had written about, uh, you know, had tried to synthesize Christianity with Aristotle. But in the Renaissance, it's like, look, let's look at these classics in their own right. Okay, so when Petrarch was reading Cicero, uh, yes, that is syncretism, what we think about as syncretism. And the best example of that is, uh, you know, Pico's oration on the dignity of man, uh, you know, where we see that basically, uh, you know, Pico della Mirandola is taking like, you know, bits from, you know, Arabian philosophy, uh, you know, from the Bible and also from Plato and throwing those things together. Now, that's another thing that, you know, when we think about like the Renaissance, uh, you know, Aristotle was a very popular philosopher in the Middle Ages, but Plato is really like the philosopher of the Renaissance. So if we look at the school of Athens, uh, you know, because the Renaissance is very much about projecting an ideal. OK, so when we think about this, it's about projecting an ideal. Now, um, I had to tell people in my last session, it's like when you see me looking up like this, um, you know, I have to in order to be able to show y'all stuff and interact with y'all at the same time, I have to. Uh, I have to sh have two screens. And so one of my screens is actually above the other. They're not like, which I guess it's not like, you know, it'd be more awkward if I were looking to the side all the time. Right. Uh, and so let me go ahead and share this screen with you real quick. And, you know, so the school of Athens. OK, so when we look at the center of this painting, uh, we see Plato and Aristotle. And what's important about this is we see that Plato is pointing so Plato is pointing up. OK, so Plato is, you know, his philosophy was more idealistic. Now, Aristotle is waving his hand above the ground. OK, so he's like, look, Plato, let's get real. OK, whereas Plato's like, look at the potential of human beings. Now, remember, Plato is modeled after Leonardo da Vinci. Um, he is made, uh, you know, because da Vinci was this Renaissance man, this prodigy who was, uh, you know, the person who was good at all kinds of different things. Um, you know, so who does say? Yes, yeah, Socrates. OK, so what you've got here is you've got Socrates, uh, you know, here on the side. So what he's trying to do, Raphael is depicting these philosophers. And that's what I love about Renaissance art is that not only is it technically perfect and pleasing to look at, but you see here that you've got Plato and Aristotle in the middle. And Socrates wasn't really the type of guy who sought attention. And so you see him talking to a group of people. Uh, and then you see here Diogenes, uh, you know, the cynic philosopher who one time it was said that Diogenes, like Alexander the Great, came up to him uh, and, you know, wanted to talk to him. And this guy's talking to Alexander the Great. But the first thing he says to Alexander is, could you move over? You're in my light. 
And, you know, so this guy is portrayed, you know, he just basically, he was very annoyed by people in general. And so you see Diogenes just sitting there by himself, uh, you know, not really, you know, very antisocial. And so all of these people are depicted in, you know, in kind of a way that like, what if we could get all these great philosophers in like the same place at the same time? You know, what would that look like? And so that's really like when you when you look at what's going on, you know, the whole thing about the Renaissance is portraying, you know, reality as idealized. OK, so, you know, when we say that Renaissance art projects a uh, let's see. Uh, yeah. And, and you'll be able to look at those things, Max. Uh, you'll be able to look at the archive. It's not like this thing just disappears. So you can actually go back and look at this stuff. OK, so, yeah. Yeah. Well, Deb, now when you have a question, don't add, like some questions I'll get to in the chat that we've got kind of a small group. But the best way to do this is to ask a question. There's a little place there to ask a question and then you can upvote people's questions. So I get to see like, you know, think about Plato upvote. All right. So, uh, you know, you can say, I like that question. I want to ask that too. And then that way the best questions filter through. Now, right now, AP Euro is a small subject and it's September. But as we keep doing these reviews on a weekly basis, uh, then we're going to see more people in here. So I want to make sure those of y'all over here know how this works. Okay. So basically, you know, Petrarch is, you know, he finds these classical texts that had been decaying, uh, you know, these uh, works of Cicero that had really been forgotten about. And so Petrarch is really, really upset and basically says, even though when we look at it objectively, the monks did a pretty good job like transcribing the classics. Like we have a lot of works of classical literature. You know, we even have a lot of Cicero's private letters. Um, so they did a pretty good job, but Petrarch didn't think they did enough. And he cursed this dark age, as he called it. And the whole thing, like if we think about like this course is a course in modern European history. OK, so modern European history begins with the Renaissance. And part of that is because they said it did. OK, like we really could begin modern history at any time, but it begins with the Renaissance because the Renaissance historians were the first people to come up with what's called this uh, tripartite division of history into ancient, medieval and modern. And so they said that their period was actually starting the modern age, you know, and whether we're, you know, now I think, you know, if we go on another thousand years, you know, they'll probably want to differentiate us from the Renaissance or something like that. But then, you know, maybe some kind of postmodern age or something like that. But not to be confused with postmodernism necessarily. But then again, if we think about the Middle Ages, about a thousand years and the ancient world is a few thousand years, you know, then, you know, thousands of years, then yeah, we've, you know, modern history, that's what this is. So about 1450 to present, but Petrarch is really the person that gets this started with this, you know, fascination with the classics, with this Greek, Roman, and biblical literature. And so as far as that, uh, as far as that goes, uh, you know, the Medici family, okay, so the influence of the Medici family, and this is what's very important, like, you know, I've, uh, you know, I follow Elon Musk on Twitter, uh, you know, and of course, you know, he's had kind of uh, an interesting run lately, you know, Elon Musk is, uh, you know, whether he's actually like going off the rails, or he just wants us to think so, you know, it's like, really, when it comes down to it, it's like Elon Musk, like, you know, I was, I've watched probably about a third to half of that Joe Rogan podcast. And I'm like, wow, like Elon Musk is, I thought before I watched that, I thought this was a genius. And now I'm like, this guy's like really a genius. Uh, you know, and, and people like Elon Musk, it's like business people are responsible for a lot of the progress that happens. And the Medici family, you know, really without the Medici family, without these rich business people who thought, you know what, I want to patronize the arts, okay? I want to find talented artists and I want to, uh, you know, I want to help them. I want to support their work, okay? Um, and so as far as that goes, you know, the Medici are serving in that role and they're commissioning all these great works of art. Now, it's not necessarily like a completely selfless venture. Uh, you know, when, uh, you know, they're looking for somebody in Florence to complete, to put a dome on top of their church. Now, here's another thing about the Renaissance and we think about humanism and the fascination with ancient Greece and Rome. One thing that, you know, although the Middle Ages figured out, you 
you know, they figured out some ways to rotate crops. They figured out some other things, but they forgot how to make a dome. And so basically, you know, in Florence, they wanted the cathedral to have a dome on top of it. And, you know, they were looking for somebody to do that. Now, Brunelleschi got the dome. But the thing is that the Florence Cathedral, by putting that dome on there, it made Florence look powerful. You know, so it, it made the the city more prestigious and the Medici more prestigious as well. Michelangelo's David was also commissioned by the Medici to show the greatness of the city-state of Florence and how Florence was ready to challenge, uh, you know, Rome or whatever other people would try to undermine Florentine prominence. And so as far as that goes now, Lorenzo, you know, Cosimo de' Medici, uh, you know, was the first person actually, you know, now the Medici had a bank. All right. That's how they are. Uh, and this is part of what makes this whole thing modern. OK, because in the Middle Ages, banking was frowned upon. That's why typically uh, if you wanted to borrow money during the Middle Ages, you'd have to borrow it from the town Jew. Uh, because, yeah, this is we're getting into patronage, nor exactly. Um, but you'd have to go to uh, to a Jew because the Jews were allowed uh, to bank because it's not seen as very Christian. Because if we think about the teachings of Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ said not only like don't lend money with interest, but he said that if you lend someone money, don't expect to be paid back. No, just forget about it. You know, it's like, hey, here's 20 bucks, whatever. If I don't get it back again. Now, that's certainly, that's a great Christian thing to do, but it's no way to do business. And this is an example of, you know, how, and we've got 19 in here right now. Be sure to tell your friends about these things. Uh, don't hide this under a bushel. Uh, so, you know, as far as that, uh, as far as that goes, ladies and gentlemen, that the Medici are really doing something modern because today in our economy, we wouldn't think twice. You know, it's like if you lend money, you expect for that money to draw interest. Um, and so, you know, that wasn't seen in the Middle Ages as something good. Now, another thing is we think about the, the market economy that we have today uh, that, you know, it was, uh, oh, excellent. Thank you so much, Donna. And you know, so as far as as far as that goes, like today, like my brother uh, is in Wilmington, North Carolina. All right. And he lives there. And I was like, hey, you need a place to stay. I'm in South Carolina, but I'm like in like the mountains, south, like close to the mountains, South Carolina. So, you know, we'll get some rain. We'll get some wind. But, you know, I'm not worried. So I asked my brother, you want to come stay over here? And he's like, no, I'm going to ride it out. And he showed me his pantry. Um, he's got, uh, I mean, he's got like eight, like two and a half gallon, like things of water. Uh, you know, he's got his, uh, you know, his Budweiser and all of this other stuff, uh, you know, and he's, he's 30. So he's old enough to drink and all of that kind of stuff. But, you know, he showed me all this stuff he's got, he's prepared. Now, the thing is, if the hurricane hit there and, you know, he decides to sell that water at a high price, like he says, hey, I've got two and a half gallons of water here for 20 bucks. Now, you know, a lot of people would find him immoral. But then again, if somebody has no water, then from a market perspective, if the person's willing to pay, if the person is willing to pay $20 for two and a half gallons of water, then, you know, that's a market transaction that doesn't have any morality about it. Now, we think about the Middle Ages. The Middle Ages had a traditional economy, and, and it's uh, basically seen as there's a just price for something. And so this is the world that they're inheriting. And so when the Medici are saying like, hey, we're lending money and we expect to gain interest, we expect for our bank to be a profitable enterprise and we expect to make money off of it, then that is a very modern understanding. So that's why, you know, when we think about the Renaissance, we're thinking in terms of, you know, this is something that is modern, okay? This is starting to get the characteristics of modern. And so as far as that, that's really, I think, the biggest contribution to the Medici, you know, Cosimo and Lorenzo, that they are patronizing the arts. They're also patronizing philosophy. Pico della Mirandola, who was uh, the person who wrote the oration on the dignity of man, he had all of these like grandiose kind of ideas that, uh, you know, he said that he was going to convene a council of scholars in Rome and that when this council of scholars finally met, it was going to culminate in the second coming of Christ. You know, the second coming of Christ is going to happen. 
Now, as a lot of men, uh, as happens to a lot of men, he was going through Florence. He was on his way to Rome, you know, to try to convene this council of scholars. And he got distracted by Lorenzo de Medici's cousin's wife. And, you know, the thing is, this was not something, it's not like today where somebody just gets embarrassed if they're caught uh, in an affair. Like this was a cap, like you could kill, you could be executed for, uh, you know, for being with another man's wife. And so, uh, you know, Pico was thrown into jail and something very bad could have happened to him. But Lorenzo goes to his cousin and he says, look, this guy's a philosopher. You got to let him go. And I mean, that's the kind of guy that Lorenzo was, that it's like, we can't just kill this guy. He's too valuable because he is a philosopher and we need to help the philo. I mean, it's like, I want to support philosophers. So Lorenzo wanted to support philosophy. He wanted to support the arts, uh, you know, and there are a lot of, uh, you know, rich business people who, you know, do these, uh, you know, these, these ventures of philanthropy. And I think that makes things very modern to make a profit and then to use that profit to actually do, excuse me, something good. So when we think about the Renaissance, uh, Jacob, you know, we think in terms of like last time we were focused on the Middle Ages. Okay. And so one of the things that we see is the, is the transition of secularism. Now, remember, secularism does not mean irreligious. These people were still Christians. Now they were kind of unorthodox Christians. Okay. So for example, uh, Pico's 900 theses that you see after uh, the oration on the dignity of man. Now the church banned uh, Pico's work. They they condemned it because basically Pico drew on Christianity, but he also drew on like, you know, Greek philosophy and, you know, Greek and Roman writers and even, you know, Arab writers. And so, you know, he is drawing on all these things. And the Catholic Church was like, no, 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 no. We don't, uh, you know, we don't approve of this. But at the same time, the message that's being sent here is we're going to put these things together. We're going to combine the classical tradition and the, and the Christian tradition. So you've got that. Now, another thing which, you know, now is kind of unique to the Italian Renaissance, you know, part of this humanistic mindset is individualism, okay? That it's like I as an individual is more important. Yes, yes, Christian, yes. Yeah. So the thing is that individualism, like remember that in the Middle Ages, everything is about what group you were a part of, okay? So I'm part of this group or that group, and I know my place in society. And people tended like, you know, like when we look at the Middle Ages, there were a lot of people that, oh, I'm sure that was great. I love, I love me some Pico, Tiffany. But, you know, there were people in the Middle Ages that if I was a blacksmith, you know, I was part of the black, you know, I, I'd have to be in there with a guild of blacksmiths. I'd, you know, observe the rules of the guild. I had a stable job and, you know, I worked the hours that I was supposed to work. I didn't really try to compete with anybody. Uh, you know, I, I'm not trying too hard and I'm fine with what I've got. And so another thing, like when you think about individualistic societies is you're trying to advance yourself. And the other thing, when we think about combining the classical and the Christian traditions, uh, that when we think about it, like from Christian teachings, to have pride in yourself is seen as a sin. Whereas the Romans and the Greeks, they didn't really have a problem with personal pride. And so that's another thing that's happening is when we think about art, uh, that in the Middle Ages, an artist wouldn't have signed their work. Who cares who you are? You know, an artist was seen as just like somebody who's like a bricklayer or a stonemason. You know, this person's the painter. They come in and paint things. But, you know, when you start to see in the Middle Ages, I mean, in the Renaissance, that they are signing like this is my individual work. So when you get turned in for plagiarism or something like that, blame the Renaissance, blame the whole modern world. You're like, you know, what is this whole thing with people wanting credit for their work? Come on now. Um, you know, and so as far as that goes now, Christian humanism. All right. Now, this is something, Nora, that 
yeah, that the Renaissance. Now, the thing is that today, now, when we hear about humanism in, you know, just pop culture today, like a lot of times humanism is like secular humanism. A lot of people today who identify as humanists, they're talking about a variant of humanism that has nothing to do with religion. But yes, Christian humanism, uh, you know, is this combining of, you know, the, you know, of the Christian tradition. And so identifying with Christianity, but also identifying with this classical literature. Now, uh, Christian humanism is typically talked about specifically in terms of the Northern Renaissance, which compared to the Italian Renaissance is more Christian and more focused on social uh, reform than it is on the individual. Now, we think about, and I've got a video on this, uh, you know, if you're not familiar with my YouTube channel, hopefully you are, but I'm on uh, YouTube. Uh, dot com slash Tom Ritchie. Um, and so if you want to look for some of the video content I've got there, I've got a comparison of the Italian Renaissance and the Northern Renaissance. And so as far as that goes, yeah, so the humanists of the Renaissance are typically Christians. I'm going to go ahead and pull that up and uh, just uh, show it to you. Uh, just give you a little brief overview because this is something, you know, I mean, I can, I can show stuff I've got on YouTube as long as I'm brief about it, right? And so as far as this uh, as far as this goes, let's see. So um, you know we're comparison compare when we're comparison when we're comparing things set differences and similarities. Now when we think about Machiavelli, okay. So we think about Machiavelli. Uh, you know he represents this individualistic and more secular approach to things. Like when we read Machiavelli, you know it's better to be feared than loved and all of that kind of stuff. You know that's not really a a Christian, uh, you know, Christian mindset. Uh, so as far as that goes now, and Nora, just one thing to note here while I've got your question in front of me, uh, that's a reformation thing that you're asking about the religion of the air area. Um, at this time at, that we're in right now, everybody is still in Western Europe is still Catholic. So individualistic and secular, you know, that basically if you read the prints, you're trying to advance yourself. Um, and so then the Northern Renaissance. Now, if you're reading Utopia or the Praise of Folly by uh, Erasmus, uh, you know, Moore's Utopia or the Praise of Folly, you know, they are criticizing institutions at that time, like really like Moore and, uh, you know, really Moore and Erasmus are almost like the original social justice warriors, if you want to think of them that way, because they're looking at the injustices that existed in their society and thinking about how to correct them rather than thinking about like, you know, if you look at Machiavelli, that you are you know, you are looking at uh, the, you know, how am I going to advance myself? How do I rule over other people? Or if you look at Castillone, the book of the courtier, how do I advance myself like and become somebody who is an advisor to rulers, which really those people a lot of times are more powerful than the actual ruler. And so as far as that goes, we've got to think about like, what are some contrasting characteristics? What is some evidence to support that? And what do they have in common, okay? And so what we see here is the Italian Renaissance is more individualistic and secular, whereas the Northern Renaissance is more socially oriented and Christian. But what we want to be, you know, be very clear about here is that both of these, the Italian Renaissance humanist and the Northern Renaissance humanist, they're both inspired by classical studies, okay? So Machiavelli is being inspired by his studies of ancient Rome. There was actually Actually, uh, Donna, you might be interested in this. Uh, I showed my kids this today. There was an article published this week about how Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook is obsessed with Augustus Caesar. Uh, and, you know, when he went on his honeymoon in 2012, he and his wife went to Rome. And, you know, his wife said that she felt like there were three people on the honeymoon, uh, the two of them and Augustus, because basically Mark Zuckerberg wanted to, like, you know, take pictures with all of the statues of Augustus Caesar. And Machiavelli looked at people like Augustus Caesar as, you know, the models of how to lead and how to rule. Now, Augustus, you know, was somebody who was ruthless sometimes. You know, Augustus was willing to uh, take vengeance on his enemies and eliminate them. Uh, you know, he was someone 
I wouldn't say Augustus was evil, but he was someone who always did what was necessary to make himself more powerful and Rome more powerful as he saw it. And so seeing that, you know, it really kind of underscores now, you know, I don't think anybody, you know, holds up Mark Zuckerberg as, uh, well, as, you know, I guess like they're, you know, students, they did just kind of you know, stared or whatever, uh, you know, or made some kind of irrelevant joke. But, you know, but the thing is, I think what 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 it drives home is like Mark Zuckerberg's not somebody that people think like, I want my kid to be like that in terms of I want people to have his moral character, because Facebook is very like morally suspect when you think about it, like, you know, in any company like makes the decision at some point, I either want my company to be like, as profitable as it can be, or I want my company to be known for making a positive impact on the world. And so Facebook over and over again chose grow, 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 grow. And it's, uh, you know, become a place that, you know, they're starting to lose some ground now, you know, because of some of those decisions. Now, of course, they want to, you know, kind of Re rehabilitate their image, but they're doing that to make more money, which nothing wrong with making money, right? This is the modern world, not the middle ages. And so as far as that goes though, Mark Zuckerberg is certainly somebody that we would call successful. And so when we talk about this, like, you know, everybody's talking about, oh, we need more STEM education, you know, math and science. But really when it comes down to it, you know, Mark Zuckerberg is not where he is just because he has technical expertise. Mark Zuckerberg is where he is because he looked up to a Roman emperor. And so when you think about that, the humanistic curriculum, which, uh, you know, one thing to kind of think about is our public schools use the largely the progressive model of education, whereas a lot of your prep schools are still using elements of the humanistic model, you know, where, you know, if you go to these prep schools, you're learning, uh, you know, Latin and you're learning, you know, you're reading the classics and that sort of thing. And the reason for that is because, you know, Machiavelli and the other Renaissance humanists are saying this is how you will learn about people and learn how to become a better person. You know, when we were talking about, um, you know, when we were talking about uh, Castiglione today as well, we're talking about civic humanism. And, you know, as far as that goes, uh, you know, Castiglione, a lot of the things that he says are really very applicable today. Um, you know, so it's a gentleman's handbook, but, you know, the thing is society changes but people don't change. And so that's why the Renaissance curriculum is very, very heavy on, you know, on history, uh, you know, and literature and philosophy coming from ancient Greece and Rome. And so as far as that goes, when you look at Machiavelli, you know, so we are, we are trying to, uh, you know, underscore to support the thesis that the Italian Renaissance is more individualistic and secular. And so when Machiavelli's like, here, read this book and learn how to be an effective leader, then that is an individualistic pursuit. It's better to be feared than love. The end justifies the means. Now, none of that sounds like Jesus, does it? Now, but when you look at Thomas More's Utopia, the ideal society, Social reform, the society where they have abolished private property, um, they have gotten rid of the corruption of wealth. A lot of this sounds very, very Christian. Now, even though we can talk about humanistic philosophy, when you look at these different humanist scholars, you see that there's really not a coherent philosophy here. Um, that what there is, is this interest in the classics. Okay, so, you know, Machiavelli is reading about Roman emperors and what they did and how they ruled. Whereas, you know, Thomas More is reading Plato's Republic, which is about the ideal state. Now, remember, the revival of Plato Plato is a very important thing in the Renaissance because Plato wasn't really read by people in the Middle Ages. They were much more prone to read Aristotle and Plato's works were not translated into Latin until after the fall of Constantinople. So as far as that goes, that's, uh, you know, an important thing to note that humanism is not so much a coherent philosophy as an interest in classical literature, the literature of ancient Greece and Rome, Greek, Roman, and biblical literature. Let's look at the questions here. Okay, so we've talked about the, uh, you know, about the Medici family. Um, 
Yeah, so let me go ahead and Jenna, let me let me get this question here. Can someone with a secular attitude still be very religious? Okay. Now, so as far as that goes, I would say yes, okay, because when it comes down to it, we can see in our society today. Now, some of y'all may be from parts of the country uh, where there aren't a lot of religious people. So, exa for example, if you're from the, uh, oh, I, wow, okay. So, um, yeah, this chair, like, has all kinds of, like, features that I'm just starting to understand. It's like, you know, the arms are set up, so if I want to sit cross-legged in it, it's very easy for me to do that. I didn't realize why I did that. Okay. So, uh, so the thing is, ladies, and gentlemen, I guess there's a reason why PewDiePie has one of these, uh, you know. So, you know, as far as far as that goes, all of us uh, that are religious in the United States today are both religious and secular. Okay, so Petrarch, um, his in his ascent of Mount Ventu. Now, Petrarch decides to climb a mountain. And he decides to climb a mountain because he read about it in a classical text in Livy's History of Rome. And there was a ruler that had climbed this mountain that was kind of near where Petrarch grew up. And Petrarch's like, I want to climb the mountain. Now, in the Middle Ages, uh, some of you may have remembered reading uh, Canterbury Tales. OK, so the thing is, like, you know, Canterbury Tales um, is you know, they're on a pilgrimage. So if you wanted to go on a vacation in the Middle Ages, like people didn't go on vacation. They went on a pilgrimage. So you're going to go to the shrine, like Canterbury Tales, they're going to the shrine of St. Thomas of Becket. And, you know, so they're on their way there and it goes over, you know, basically the stories they're telling while they're traveling. So, you know, as far as this goes, Petrarch wasn't taking a religious pilgrimage, there wasn't a relic of some saint on top of the mountain. He just wanted to climb the mountain. So he did it because he wanted to. And so the thing is, like, I mean, I, I'm personally a practicing Christian. Um, but, you know, when I read Around the World in 80 Days, I'm not reading Around the World in 80 Days so that I can become a better Christian. Uh, you know, I'm reading Around the World in 80 Days because I want to. And the other thing is, if we think about it, like when we get to the scientific revolution, uh, you know, the thing is that when Galileo starts to, you know, you, you know, Galileo and Copernicus or Copernicus and Galileo, you know, they are challenging the geocentric theory, okay, of, you know, that was conventional, basically that we are at the center, which of course is very compatible with Renaissance humanism, because that's what Pico Della Mirandola said that you, God, you have put man at the center of everything. And Galileo's like, uh-uh, you know, you're not at the center and people aren't feeling so important anymore. And, you know, you think about like the Bible, like, you know, the biblical cosmology kind of falls apart. Okay. So the thing is that even though, you know, I am a Christian, I I don't think the world was created in six days. Uh, now, of course, if I were to say that uh, in, uh, you know, 1450, I would have been burned at the stake. You know, if I would have told people like, hey, that just doesn't seem very rational to me uh, that God, you know, just created the world in six days. Uh, you know, I think this might be a story that some people, you know, use to try to explain how God did these things or something like that. But today, you know, somebody can say like, I'm a Christian, but you know, I think that these scientific explanations, you know, for things are, you know, better than that. Like a secular Christian, you know, there are a lot of Christians who, uh, you know, I mean, I, I think that, you know, human evolution is, uh, you know, it explains a lot of things. And, you know, I, I'm a Christian, but I believe in human evolution. Now, what if I were to say this 150 years ago? then that would have been very problematic. Um, so, you know, as far as that goes, I think that, you know, part of what we see in the Renaissance is this combination. We see the beginning of it. Now, I think we see a lot more of it now, but the combining of Christian and secular thought, okay? So that's what's really important about the Renaissance and what makes it modern is that Christianity does not have to be the foundation for all of our thinking. You know, I would say that my faith, my religious faith is part of my life, um, but I would not say that it's like the, you know, the major driving force behind my life. Now, some people would uh, would say that it is, and that's, that's fine, but hopefully you can see where I'm going with this is that I consider myself a secular Christian, uh, you know, because I do believe in, uh, you know, in the Christian religion and, you know, attend church and raise my daughter as a Christian. You know, I try to pray when I can, uh, but at the same time, I don't base my entire life on that. 
And so, you know, with that, let me uh, let me see here. So we've been over the influence of the Medici family. I forgot to uh, I forgot to note that I was answering that question. I'll start to get with it uh, because what uh, what the ideal here is that is I'm able to go through here. Then I am able to say, OK, I'm answering this question or that question. OK, could we go over the Protestant Reformation? Max, I'm going to invite you on screen. OK, let's see. Now, Max, you don't have to join me on screen, but I'm going to invite you on screen and see if you'd like to join me. Uh, is there anybody that would like? I mean, you know, we've gone on about the Renaissance, but there seem to be some questions about the Protestant Reformation. Um, send me in a direction. OK, so let's go ahead and like, you know, let me know. But I have invited you. So if you want to, you know, get on your webcam and actually uh, chat with me uh, or if anybody else does ask a question, y'all go ahead and get those questions out there. We've got about 20 minutes left in this broadcast. Surely I've got some questions. All right. So uh, so as far as that uh, sort of thing now, uh, Nora, your question kind of goes into the Reformation when you think about the peace of Augsburg, um, you know, whoever reigns his religion. So at first, when Martin Luther tried to, uh, you know, start the Reformation, Charles V, Emperor Charles V said, no, Martin Luther is an outlaw. Everybody's going to be Catholic. Now, the Holy Roman Empire, as Voltaire said, was neither holy nor Roman nor an empire. So there were a lot of nobles, uh, you know, people who were very powerful in the Holy Roman Empire that said, I want to be Lutheran. I like this Protestantism thing. And so what happened was a lot of these nobles supported Luther. They fought wars over this. Uh, and then finally, uh, a few decades after, you know, Luther's 95 Theses, I think about 30 years whereabouts, um, you know, that you've got, uh, you know, the Peace of Augsburg, which says whoever reigns his religion. OK, so whoever reigns his religion. And I'm not sure. I think that I invited Max, but I don't know. Um, OK, but y'all remember that, like there are some uh, there are some options uh, for y'all to join me on screen. Now, the other thing is that even in other places, so for example, uh, you know, you'll get to Louis the Fourteenth later, who said one king, one law, one faith. Um, and so Louis the Fourteenth said that the whole country is going to be Catholic, even though his grandfather, after the French Wars of Religion, issued the Edict of Nantes, which said that you know we're uh, you know there are people in certain places that can be Huguenots. All right. So as far as that goes, we've got uh, we've got that question. All right. So um, can I talk about Jan Hus? Sure. OK, well, that's a great one, Jalen. That's a great one. All right. So Jan Hus. Now, I mentioned that, uh, you know, as far as that. OK, now, uh, Max, it would take me hours to like talk about the Reformation. Also, I've got a Reformation uh, playlist. And yeah, y'all don't have to say if I invite you to come on live, like, uh, yeah, no big deal if you don't want to. Um, but if you can tell me like when I see Jan Hus, for example, now Jan Hus was a uh, was a person who was a leader of this faction of Hussites. Now, really, if Martin Luther had written, and this really goes into the influence of the printing press. OK, so Martin Luther after the printing press, Jan Hus before the printing press. And so Jan Hus was in Bohemia, where you'll see the Thirty Years War start. And Hus uh, was the leader of this Hussite faction. Now, he wasn't like, you know, condemning the church or whatever, but his faction, you know, they had some beliefs that were not, uh, you know, in accordance with uh, the beliefs of the Catholic Church. And so he was condemned. And, you know, now this is something that with Martin Luther, for example, uh, you know, for the um, the emperor, yeah, not not Frederick, uh, his protector, but Charles V offered Martin Luther safe passage to his trial. OK, so essentially, in order to get Martin Luther to come out of hiding and to go to the Diet of Worms, where Charles V was going to hold court and, you know, put him on trial, he said that Luther, you have safe passage. So basically, Luther comes to the trial and he's guaranteed to be able to leave. OK, so he's kind of got a head start. He's able to leave. And so that's how you get into a peer. Jan Hus was given the same guarantees. It's just the emperor at the time just decided not to keep it. And so Jan Hus was burned at the stake and his, uh, you know, his movement ended up kind of dying out because it was before the printing press. And so when you think about that, that Luther, it, the thing is that the dramatic thing about Luther is people talk about, oh, he nailed the 95 theses to the church door. That's really not what matters because if it had been before the printing press, they just pulled the 95 theses down, they burned him at the stake. Jan Hus, all they had to do, burn him at the stake. That's the end of it. Now, Luther, 
not only did Luther nail these to the church door, but a printer decided I'm going to print the 95 theses. And these 95 theses start circulating all over Europe. So it's the type of thing that we see, uh, you know, that we see today that, you know, that's actually become a thing that like, you know, now with uh, social media, you know, people can say whatever they want. And if they find an audience, then they can amplify their voice, even if they're not in a position of power and they can challenge authority. Now, of course, there you see that, uh, you know, the tech giants are starting to fight back. You know, the, uh, you know, I think uh, Alex Jones just got permanently banned from Twitter, uh, you know, a week ago. And so basically you start to see where the internet is trying to figure out, you know, how can we be a conduit of ideas, but also allow powerful people to control what is said. Um, and so, you know, the thing is, the printing press was something that undermined, you know, the authority of powerful people to control what is uh, to control what is said. And so before, the, you know, no printing press, no reformation. OK. And of course, the printing press was a big deal in the Renaissance as well, because, you know, you've got this, uh, you know, books are being, you know, more wide or more widely available because more copies can be printed, which is resulting in an increase in literacy. So uh, thank you for your question there, Jalen. And we've still got some time, still got some time. If y'all want to, uh, you know, y'all got anything else y'all want me to talk about, or we can call it a night. You know, it is, uh, you know, it's getting late here on the East Coast. All right. So uh, the point of the treaty, um, Okay. Now, Zwingli, I would, you know, that one's something, Nora, that, where did you get this one? Because this is one of those things I'm tempted to say, not on the exact, I think that that may be something you found in your textbook, but I don't think, let me make sure of this. Uh, okay. Let me just take a look here and I'm going to see if Zwingli actually like comes up anyway. Yeah. Zwingli's name does not come up anywhere in the course description. Uh, now, Martin Luther does uh, several times. OK, but basically um, the things about Luther and Zwingli, uh, you know, yeah, it was in your reading. But I would say that that's and that's part of my job here. OK, so when we you know, these fiveable broadcasts, you know, I'm not going to harp on things that aren't going to be on the exam. Now, that's not to say that your teacher might not ask you about it. But yeah, like uh, now Zwingli, the biggest, the most important thing about Zwingli in the context of the Reformation is that Luther and Zwingli made an effort to try to coordinate, you know, so it's like, can the Protestant movement be one coordinated thing, but they get to the point of the Eucharist. Now, this is something I think that is that is worth mentioning, OK, that basically the Catholic Church has the teaching of transubstantiation. Uh, well, it's it's a little bit now. Now, Donna, I, I'm glad you asked about that because I'm not somebody who swears by the concept outline. OK, the way that I, now it could show up in a stimulus item or something like that. But basically what they're saying is that a student would not need to know who Ehrlich Zwingli is in order to pass the exam. Uh, you know, but, you know, what I do, I mean, I, I, I teach all kinds of stuff that's not in that outline. But, you know, if, if somebody's not in the outline and I'm not, you know, very interested in it, I don't talk about it. That's kind of the way that I approach it. But as far as this goes, what is valuable about Zwingli, and I might need to investigate Swing, Zwingli a little bit more, is that there's an attempt to, can we all get on one side? And what happens here is the Catholic Church, when it comes to the Eucharist, communion, the Lord's Supper, whatever you want to call it, uh, yeah, she's trying to say thanks. I know, I know what you mean, Donna. Thank you so much. And so the Catholic Church says when Jesus says, this is my body, literal, OK, that basically the body and the blood of Christ, like if, if you're Catholic or you've been to a Catholic service, you know, that during that, during the mass, the bread and the wine are actually becoming the body and the blood of Christ and they are venerated as such. OK, so, you know, it is, you know, you need to be prepared to take it. You need to be, you know, make sure that when you're receiving this, this is the body of Christ, the blood of Christ. OK, um, I'm not so sure about that, Tiffany. Um, I would try if you're on a phone, I'd maybe try to pull this up on a computer. Uh, I'm not sure about that, but we're going to be done a little bit anyway. So the audio may be good enough. I'm not projecting anything at the moment. So as far as uh, as far as that goes, the Catholic Church, this is my body, literal. 
Okay. Now, Zwingli, which if anybody's Baptist, this is like the teaching of Baptist churches, or tends to be at least, that basically when Jesus, uh, you know, said, this is my body, this is my blood, it's a metaphor. Okay. That is Zwingli's teaching, that basically Zwingli's teaching is that it's bread, it's wine. That's it okay that it's a remembrance this is a ceremony okay so when you know it says like if you look at you know the operative word for catholics is this is my body whereas if you go to a baptist church and you see like the lord's supper table it says in remembrance of me okay so zwingli said that this is a memorial now luther remember luther is all into sola scriptura yes that basically and and some people confuse this with consubstantiation but it's not technically that but a lot of times it's used and so for a history class that's fine but yes luther believed that what zwingli was saying OK, so when you look at this, because part of what Luther's teaching is sola scriptura, that Luther says, Zwingli, you are contradicting God because Jesus says in the scripture, this is my body. And so Luther says, OK, I'm not going to go with the Catholics and say that it's physical. But since Jesus said this is my body, he must somehow be present there. Yes. Yeah, so it's like a mysterious or like spiritual presence here. Um, that you see there. And so basically over this one issue, Luther and Zwingli were unable to come to an understanding with each other um, and to be on the same side in the Reformation. And that's why, you know, what you see is like, you know, Luther, Zwingli, uh, Calvin, uh, Henry VIII, uh, the Anabaptists, you know, you've got all of these different groups. And of course, we see this in the United States, uh, which is, uh, you know, a slim majority of Americans, I believe, are, you know, Protestant. And so, you know, but it's all kinds of different Protestant denominations. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's see. Do we have anything else? Uh, anybody else with questions? We're going to do a last call. And let me also take a look real quick and see what our, uh, you know, see what our thing is for next time. Let's see. Uh, AP Euro. Let's take a look at the AP Euro content manager. All right. Now, the thing is that I had for, you know, for next week, um, I've got the Renaissance uh, again, but I may move everything up a little bit. I may go to the age of exploration because it sounds like some of y'all, y'all tell me where are y'all right now in the course and what would be the most useful thing for me to talk about next week? Uh, next week, I could focus on the, on the, on the age of exploration. Um, you know, or I could, you know, go, I'll probably do the, I'd like to do the age of exploration before I do like, you know, the reformation and all that kind of stuff. But it sounds like some of y'all are studying the reformation. So y'all tell me, what is it y'all are doing? Um, because right now we have a situation where, you know, some people have been in school for three weeks and some people have only been in school for one week. Um, and so you're doing the reformation right now. Okay. Just started the reformation. Okay. So what I'll probably do is move the calendar up a little bit. I was planning on doing more of the Renaissance, but I think that we'll, uh, now the, with the age, of, I think the age of exploration would probably be helpful. Am I, am I right about that? But of course, just like tonight, you know, I was focused on the Renaissance, but I took questions on other things. Now, the other thing is uh, just to make sure that we're all on the same page of what Fiveable is about and what we're trying to do. Like, I want to make sure that we're doing things that are current. We're helping you in your class right now. But what you're doing right now as well is you're studying for the exam. So even if you've already taken a test on the age of exploration, it wouldn't be a bad idea to, you know, hey, let's focus on the age of exploration and look at this. So even if it's not helping you prepare for what your, your, your immediate tested, sub, you know, tested item is, then it's helping you on the exam. And so that's that's the thing that as far as that goes, uh, you know, we are trying to do well on the exam. And so I will focus on the age of exploration next week. And then now and then just like uh, this week when, you know, when we get past that, I can talk about whatever y'all want and the questions when they come in and people are upvoting and all that. We're good there. All right. So I'll move the timeline up a little bit because it seems like people have already kind of been done with the Renaissance. So that's good to know. So next week, the focus will be the age of exploration. And then the following week, I'll focus on the Protestant Reformation. But in both cases, I'll take whatever questions y'all have. 
All right. So ladies and gentlemen, thank y'all for coming. If you found this helpful, make sure to tell your friends um, and to talk, tell them to follow Fiveable here on Crowdcast. And yes, Donna, and thank you for your support and for letting people know what we're doing and, uh, you know, just trying to help uh, help kids do well on the exam and, you know, possibly sell some subscriptions at some point. But for right now, for the foreseeable future, um, Fiveable is going to be free because, uh, you know, a lot of people aren't, uh, you know, really thinking about the exam right now. So, you know, for the foreseeable future these weekly broadcasts are going to be free of charge and open to the public so be sure to let your friends know and ladies and gentlemen it's always a pleasure and remember this year is fiveable